Good afternoon, good afternoon. We are delighted that we have a quorum. The City Council Committee on the Environment is now in a public hearing to hear testimony on Bill Number 180234. Please to welcome Council Members Al Taltenberger, Councilwoman Janie Blackwell, Councilman Derek Green, and um, myself serving as chair of this committee. We will now ask the clerk to read the title of Bill Number 180234. An ordinance amending Title 21 of the Philadelphia Code entitled Miscellaneous by creating a new chapter 21 slash 2600 entitled Environmental Impact Statements to provide for the preparation of such statements in connection with council legislation, all under certain terms and conditions. Terrific. While we call up the first panel with Ms. Lynn Robinson and also with the Clean Air Council leadership, Logan Weald or Weld, please pronounce that. Well, D. Okay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask, uh, forgive me, I need to start with the administration. So let's have the administration first, Director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, to be followed by Logan Weldy and Lynn Robinson. I want to say good afternoon to my colleagues, and I want to thank everyone who stepped away from their desk to help us create a quorum this afternoon. I would be remiss always not to first say thank you to the administration for the partnership my staff has enjoyed and continues to enjoy with the mayor's legislative team and the leadership of the Office of Sustainability. Now more than ever, of course, we must continue to work to build and develop strong initiatives that will contribute, continue to contribute in a responsible, even way, healthier, safer, and more sustainable environments for our families here in the city. The EPA reports that the United States accounts for 5% of the world's population and 22% of the world's carbon emissions that contribute to greenhouse effect. Climate change and other environmental concerns are inherently linked to the public health, food, and water security of our citizens. Therefore, taking a proactive approach in understanding the effects of environmental concerns are necessary. On March the 15th of this year, my office introduced Bill Number 180234 that will create an environmental impact statement this EIS is a document prepared to describe the effects for proposed activities on the environment in the city of Philadelphia. While not a perfect document, it shall be prepared for any pendant ordinance upon the request of any member of the Philadelphia City Council. The purpose of the legislation is to ensure that council members are given adequate resources necessary to better understand the impacts that a proposed legislation may have on the quality of life here in our city. With extreme proposed federal cuts to the EPA, it be, has become increasingly imperative that the environmental community and all Philadelphians seek to do all we can in a responsible and reasonable way, given but tight budget constrictions, what we can do to protect the air, have pure water, along with a beautiful aesthetic environment. A copy of technical amendments have been circulated. In the end, everyone must recognize what matters most the priority of our citizens, the health and safety of our families and our children. For these reasons and many more, I'm asking for your vote on this bill. And with that, we will now move to Christine Knapp, Director of the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. Thank you and good afternoon. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, uh, Chairwoman Reynolds-Brown and members of the committee. I'm Christine Knapp, I'm Director of the Office of Sustainability. Thank you for providing the opportunity to have testimony on bill number 180234. And thank you, Councilwoman, for your continuing leadership and support for sustainability efforts in Philadelphia. The Office of Sustainability is responsible for the implementation of GreenWorks, a vision for a sustainable Philadelphia, which is the city's plan to create a healthy, equitable, and sustainable city for all Philadelphians. The plan includes action on air, food, energy, climate change, natural resources, waste, transportation, and economic opportunity. While the Office of Sustainability plays a central coordinating role for city government, we also work closely with numerous other partners to advance progress. Other city departments and agencies, external nonprofits, academic institutions, community groups, and city council members are all important stakeholders that help implement programs and policies that advance our vision. To that end, Bill number 180234 gives city council a more explicit role in advancing sustainability by creating the opportunity for council members to request an environmental impact statement in relation to certain city ordinances. The statement would enable the Office of Sustainability in partnership with relevant other city agencies to review the proposed legislation and analyze how it might help or hurt the city meet our sustainability goals. 
This information will then be shared with council members to inform their decision making regarding that specific ordinance. We feel this legislation will help to empower city council members with information and will help to ensure the sustainability goals of the city are given thoughtful consideration in the legislative process. For this reason, I am pleased to support Bill Number 180234, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Any questions for the witness, this witness, the administration? Well, we thank you, the leadership of the Office of Sustainability, and we thank you for working with our office in tandem to craft a piece of legislation that is not perfect, but moves us closer to what we can do in a reasonable way given our tight budget constraints. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Now if we will call up our last and final panel with Ms. Lynn Robinson, Director of the Neighbors Against the Gas Plants, and also Logan Weldy, Leadership of Clean Air Council. Please uh, have a seat and please uh, state your name and provide your testimony. Okay, good, good afternoon. afternoon. Thank you. I'm not going to give a flowery speech. Um, I'm just going to go right for it. And uh, I hope that Councilman Green is paying attention because I'm oh. an ex-teacher. I just retired. Everybody has to pay attention. <laughs> um, what's the matter? Oh, thank you. All right, so this is about bill number 180234. Um, it's a good looking ordinance except for two aspects which could be fatal flaws, quote unquote, if not corrected. These aspects are number five at the end, and the one other major repeating directive, which threatens separation of legislative and executive powers. We have needed an ordinance similar to this and could have avoided SEPTA's attempt to operate a polluting gas power plant project in Nicetown with simply exhibit A, section one, which reads, provide an overview of the purpose and need for the proposed legislation. You know, propose, I mean, giving need for a project should be the, the first thing that the city demands, and I'm glad it's number one. The problem with number five, okay, um, it says, the lack of preparation of an environmental impact statement requested pursuant to the section shall not preclude the final adoption of a bill. In translation, this means that at the discretion of council as a whole, or at the discretion of a district council member, any private company or public utility can negotiate to skirt an environmental impact statement for a polluting project in a Philadelphia neighborhood. Number five is an obvious loophole and openly invites trade-offs between public health and whatever can be offered to council to create a quid pro quo. This type of loophole is called corruption. Please strike number five from the language of the bill if I'm misinterpreting the intent of that language and it is not intended as a loophole, then the language needs refining so that no council person or polluter or lawyer in the future will misinterpret it. The fatal flaw on, uh, fatal flaw on bill number 180234 needs to be removed in order for the bill to have any teeth and actually be utilized evenly and fairly. The other issue is separation of legislative, executive, and judicial powers. If I understand the language correctly, environmental impact statements are to be forwarded to the Director of Sustainability. If that means the Mayor's Office of Sustainability, then we have a problem of merging the separate parts of our democratic process. City Council needs its own measuring stick for sustainability, perhaps fashioned from the environmental groups in the city which function because their constituents volunteer their time or make them, to make them functional, and while others have salary positions in those uh, environmental groups. Um, so please keep a clear line between legislative and executive branches in this ordinance. In summary, please make this bill truly protective of the city environment with no wiggle room. If this ordinance cannot be made retroactive, council will need to find another way to halt SEPTA's plan to burden the Lower Northwest with 81.6 tons of toxic emissions, which will be added to diesel exhaust from SEPTA's largest bus depot and Route 1 traffic. These added emissions would cause an exacerbated range of public health disease stressors such as dementia and for children impaired cognitive development 
asthma, COPD, high blood pressure, and kidney disease. Thank you for listening. We'll hear all of the testimony and then address your concern regarding number five, and I am going to yield to the lawyer in our, on our committee, uh, Councilman Derek Green, with regards to uh, our ability to hold up a bill. Um, please, let's hear from Mr. Weldy. And Good. let me acknowledge the presence of uh, council member, council member of this committee, Councilwoman Helen Kim. Please. Good afternoon, and thank you for allowing us to testify. My name is Logan Weldy. I'm a staff attorney at Clean Air Council. Um, Clean Air Council, our mission is to protect and defend everyone's right to breathe clean air and have a healthy environment. We have over 5,000 members and activists throughout Philadelphia. While Bill number 180234 was proposed with good intentions and the Clean Air Council strongly supports its intent to better inform city council members and other members of the Philadelphia government of the environmental impacts of any actions they take, this proposed bill does not accomplish that goal in a meaningful way and therefore Clean Air Council cannot support this bill in its current form. Under environmental law, an environmental impact statement is a serious undertaking that fully assesses any and all environmental impacts of a proposed action. Traditionally, an EIS, as they're known, is overseen by a group of engineers who have the proper technical tools to collect data and complete an environmental impact statement. What is proposed in this bill is not an environmental impact statement. It is misleading to the members of City Council and their concerned constituents to refer to the process envisioned by this bill as an environmental impact statement. Clean Air Council would support changing the name from environmental impact, some impact statement to something not associated with this existing requirement, possibly something like administrative environmental assessment or something. Um, however, a name change alone does not allay all of our concerns with this bill. We are very concerned that this bill tasks the Office of Sustainability with completing this analysis. While Clean Air Council has the utmost respect for the Office of Sustainability, we do not believe that the staff have either the training or resources to complete an EIS or something similar. Due, the, due to the extensive time and research needed to complete an EIS, it is unlikely that the Office of Sustainability currently has the technical tools or funds to prepare environmental impact statements for the City of Philadelphia. Additionally, with only 10 days to properly complete an environmental impact statement, it is unlikely that these statements will be completed in time. An actual EIS can take months to years to accomplish. Clean Air Council's final concern with the bill is that it does not create a mandatory obligation. The City of Philadelphia must comply with the Pennsylvania Constitution, including Article 1, Section 27, called the Environmental Rights Amendment, or ERA. This amendment reads, the people have a right to clean air, pure water, and and to the preservation of natural, scenic, historic, and aesthetic values of the environment. Pennsylvania's public natural resources are the common property of all the people, including generations yet to come. As trustees of these resources, the Commonwealth shall conserve and maintain them for the benefit of all the people. Recent, Supreme Court, re recent Pennsylvania Supreme Court decisions have held that the ERA creates a duty of any agency of the Commonwealth to protect the environment and, quote, requires each branch of government to consider in advance of proceeding the environmental effect of any proposed action on the constitutionality, uh, sorry, on the constitutionally protected features, unquote. This makes an environmental review of some sort of obligation not voluntary or avoidable, but mandatory. Clean Air Council does support this committee's efforts as evidenced by the intent of this bill. However, Clean Air Council does not support this per current proposed legislation for the previously stated reasons. Additionally, Clean Air Council would invite this committee to address other pressing environmental issues facing Philadelphians. Philadelphia is extremely polluted. Its air, land, and water are trashed. The Council is concerned that this committee has not met in over a year, and in fact has only met a handful of times over the past five years. The Council would ask that this committee hold hearings on the state of the environment of Philadelphia, including issues such as litter and short dumping, addressing plastic bag usage, circulars, and all single-use plastic, lack of vision on electric vehicles, poor implementation of solar, wind, and sustainable energy sources, lack of enforcement of commercial recycling, and low rate of residential recycling, no citywide policy on e-waste, no enforcement of energy codes by L&I during standard building inspections, and little to no enforcement of city, city idling laws. I, I am aghast at the fact that no agency in Philadelphia has any idling uh, 
rules at all. And we calculated there's about $6 million in waste over the last two years of city vehicles sitting and idling when the drivers go to lunch or they sleep in their vehicles. Uh, and idling pollution is the single largest air pollution, illegal air pollution in Philadelphia. We are generally, generally concerned that there are so many wide-ranging and serious environmental issues that this committee could investigate. By not having regular meetings, the Clean Air Council is concerned that these important environmental issues are not being addressed. We call on this committee, in particular Councilwoman Reynolds Brown's office, to invite groups like ours to begin to address these issues, as well as schedule regular meetings of the Environmental Committee. Thank you. Uh, if we could uh, please first please start with your concerns, uh, Ms. Robinson. I'm going to yield with Councilman Green uh, with regards to uh, the, the request of Ms. Robinson um, and our ability to hold up a bill because we, we do not have, I don't want to misquote you, my dear. Um, um, what I'm saying is number five uh, basically is a loophole. It allows there not to be an, an environmental impact study. And so it's not mandatory. And unless an environmental impact study is mandatory, there's no point in the bill. Um, it's not going to protect the city. Because anybody with a nice deal, you know, is going gonna, is gonna to make a deal with someone in city council or with the council to get around that. And anybody with what kind of deal? Well, it, it, it opens the door for deal making. It opens the door for a company or a public utility to say, well, I'm going to put money into this project, which you really want if I don't have to do the impact study. And the, the bill says, number five, that legislation can go forward without an impact study. And so it, I'm sort of agreeing with my colleague right here. My, my speech is not as sophisticated, but um, this bill does not make the study mandatory. And so it, from, what, from my reading of it. Councilman Green. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the, the plain reading of this language says a lack of a lack of preparation of an environmental impact statement requested pursuant to the section should not preclude the final adoption of a bill. Oh, the yes. language of a bill is um, broad, meaning that any type of legislation that will come through this body, um, this basically, from my understanding, this provides the opportunity that if any member of council would like to request an environmental impact study or any pending ordinance, they can do so. But the language is also stated in a way that it's not going to preclude final adoption of, of all bills within our body. Uh, and so I, my understanding, and I can't speak for the legislative intent, but my understanding is that this provides an opportunity for anyone in council if they have an ordinance that's before us, even pre either presented by the administration or by another member of council, if they would like some type of environmental assessment, um, the they sh will be able to do so based on this legislation. But it's not saying that all legislation that comes before city council would need an environmental impact statement Pre precisely. in order to pass. It's, it's, it's viewed as an option for uh, sponsors of legislation or district council members is not viewed as a requirement. This, quite, this, the city is, is not able to uh, financially take on um, uh, environmental impacts of every major project that comes down, down the pike. It really has to be at the request of the Office of Sustainability or the sponsor uh, of the bill. Well, we really can't afford to keep on building these projects that are making people sick and making us go towards a climate change situation that we're not, that's out of our control. Like, we're sort of at that limit now. And um, if there isn't enough money, I would like to propose that you cancel the 10-year abatement for all those big skyscrapers that are going up in town. There's plenty of money in Philadelphia. It's just being held by a few. Mm -hmm. So there is money. I, I just don't buy that. Okay. Any other comments for this witness? Councilman Green? Yeah, I do have actually a question for um, Ms. Knapp from Office of Sustainability, if she could come back to the table. Good afternoon. Uh, and I wanted to get your, your reflection on some of the comments that Mr. Weldy made regarding environmental impact statements, because I do know that is a term of art um, mm -hmm. that has a specific meaning. In fact, I just came from a construction site uh, for the new Crystal Ray High School, and they did a fi phase one environmental study regarding some issues at their um, development site. So I do know from my experience in um, real estate construction 
that there that is a specific term when you say environmental impact statement. So I'm curious from your perspective, um, your thoughts on the language or any suggestion you would make going forward. Yeah, I, I uh, certainly think that there could be some confusion created since that is a term that already has meaning and specific requirements um, at the federal level and often at the state level as well. Um, I don't think that's you know anything more than maybe just a language tweak, but I, I think the the um, the actual request of what's the information is quite different. So I think maybe just having some language differential so that we know what kind of what we're talking about a city or a state or a federal requirement could easily solve that issue. And, and then also a follow in reference to um, your understanding. Um, does your office have the capacity to do this type of let's call it environmental assessment? Mm -hmm. or now, I'll say environmental analysis. Yeah, I mean, I really think it depends on the number of requests that come mm -hmm. through, you know, in a, in a given year, the type of ordinances that we're looking at um, assessing. Um, there could be, you know, a huge differential between an ordinance approving a sidewalk cafe or, uh, you know, a street name change, you know, those types of things that probably have very little to no impact versus, um, you know, big capital projects um, that, you know, could, you know, obviously disturb land and um, uh, have energy, you know, usage, which would then create greenhouse gas emissions. So I, the, the answer is it really kind of depends. But from my sort of best guess, we could probably handle uh, an, a good deep analysis, you know, on like a meaty ordinance a couple of times a year at most. Um, but I don't think we have capacity beyond that um, on our staff um, or in our budget to then maybe contract with a consultant to do that. So if it were to exceed, you know, again, maybe two or three a year, I think we would run into a problem with being able to keep up with that request. Um, based on your knowledge of this legislation, um, what are the types of projects you, you could possibly anticipate that a member of this body would request for environmental assessment? Yeah, I mean, I think Lynn's example of the, the SEPTA project would not have come before council, so that's not that's you know, not a SEPTA project, but a similar project, a capital project, right, where there's going to be some, you know, potential impact on the surrounding community, whether that's air quality, energy use, greenhouse gas emission creation, um, wait, you know, waste and how waste is going to be disposed of. Um, so I think capital projects are the sort of th most obvious because they have such a, you know, physical, tangible impact on a space. Um, but then there's also things like, you know, a, legislation that comes before this body, sustainable business tax credit, um, benchmarking ordinances, those types of things where we could be able, we could say, you know, this bill, this po which would set a policy, um, would then help us to be able to do X, Y, or Z, or on the contrary, could inhibit us from doing X, Y, Z. So um, I think sort of specific environmental policy um, discussions obviously would also be a place where it would be mo most obvious for us to weigh in. So you're, I guess from what I'm hearing from you, you would um, possibly be needed to do an assessment for both projects that had a negative as well as a positive impact. Yeah, I mean, I think before, you know, the existence of this, this uh, proposal, we would probably already be weighing in for, potentially on legislation that we thought either had a very positive or very negative impact on the city's sustainability um, goals. So I think we would, that would sort of just be a continuation, but in a, through a more sort of formalized process. Mm -hmm. Um, when you said four to five projects per year, um, how, many sta how much staff time um, would you anticipate and what would you say would be the cost of that assessment? Mm, again, Without, I mean, kind of a back of the envelope type analysis if you were to say yeah. X number of staff that pay are paid X amount of dollars, if you were to take their annual salary and annualize it on an hourly basis, other resources, if you had outside vendors, if you could, I'm just curious if you had yes. any sense. So the best I can sort of use as an example is we use a, um, a firm called ICF. They're sort of a, an engineering and planning mm -hmm. firm. Um, mm -hmm. So we, we use them to do some analysis. Sorry? You use them for the stormwater? Um, no, no, that's uh, ICS. I, 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 uh, ICF um, is a firm that we use to help do some of our energy planning. So our municipal energy master plan and, and the uh, citywide energy vision plan that we put out recently um, were both uh, with ICF modeling support. So we ask them to help model certain things. We can usually get a price tag from them of like fifty to $75,000, depending on the size, again, of the thing. We're asking them to take on often some pretty big meaty things. So again, depending on if it's a capital project versus a policy, um, it could really you know, depend. But that's just to give you an example of a recent analysis that we got a quote from them on um, to do for us.
And most likely you would envision these type of assessments done on capital projects as opposed to <clears throat> policies or? I think it could be either. Um, I can think it'd be either policy, policy, policy analysis might be a little easier for us to do in-house. Um, capital projects because they, again, have so much potential impact on so many different pieces of physical space um, might, be, might be more expensive to do. Uh, I know we're in, in the midst of coming to um, the end of this um, FY19 budget season, mm -hmm. and you know, the capital program is a one-year program. And then the, I mean, the capital budget is a one-year budget, but the capital program is a six-year um, um, planning document. Um, what, does this legislation give you any thoughts in reference to going into future? So an FY20 capital program budget, and then the FY20 um, going forward capital program um, thoughts in reference to additional dollars that should be allocated into the capital program to provide resources in order to do these type of environmental assessments, at least on the capital project side? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, the guidance we get from the capital budget office is that we're able to use capital budget on analysis uh, or planning uh, regarding other capital investments. So if something is going to help us decide how to use our capital dollars, we can use our capital budget to do that analysis. So for the purposes of evaluating potentially a capital project, you know, doing an environmental impact statement for that, we would be able to use our capital budget for it if we have capital budget available. Right now we um, don't have any FY19 capital budget um, allocated, yes. so we would need to uh, revisit how, how the dollars are allocated for that purpose. Right, that's because I would not hope it would come through your capital budget dollars, because that's an issue that I've been trying to focus on mm -hmm. in this process, but for um, the capital program office or the specific department that's doing a capital project, to me, that's where the dollars should be allocated. Sure, Not yeah. Not out of your, your yeah. budget, yeah. but out of the budget that, of the department for the project that's being contemplated. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's possible. Um, we do try to engage, you know, the capital planning process so that when we understand what uh, departments are proposing, we can get in early and sort of get them to think a little bit more about energy efficiency or other sustainability measures in the design of their capital projects. So we have a good understanding of who those departments are and where there might be possibilities to plug in more capital for them to do an analysis. Um, one of the reasons why we hold capital dollars in our office that we end up distributing back to um, offices is so that we can be the, the sort of um, pass through that is thoughtful about sustainability on the way. So it's just a way for us to hold the dollars, think about how they're getting used, what impact they can have to achieve our sustainability goals, and then push back out to departments. So it, it could, could be a similar scenario in this, of that we're going to be the ones in charge through this legislation of doing the analysis. Maybe it makes sense for the dollars to come through us to then an analyze what's being done by another department. I think you could probably go either way. Okay, so based on what you're saying, you're talking about maybe five projects, you're talking about $350,000 roughly back in the envelope. If you're saying 60, 000, 60 to $70,000 for um, a major capital project, uh, and when you look at the capital program and the capital budget, you know, we have a pretty significant um, number of capital projects each year. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Um, I, think that, I think one of the things maybe going forward is having those conversations with um, the capital program office, mm -hmm. uh, as well as administration in reference to allocating dollars in the capital program and the capital budget specifically for, we'll say, environmental assessments, not mm -hmm. to be part of the uh, Office of Sustainability, but actually out of the capital program office to be used. Um, it's hard, to, it's kind of a chicken and egg because right. we haven't had this before, um, but then when you have it, you're not sure how much it will be used. Um, we're just talking about capital projects. We haven't even gone to the policy issues of if there's certain initiatives that you know you name the department that it may be doing that may have some type of uh, environmental um, impact that may need some type of analysis or assessment. Okay, just just some thoughts. No, the, the, um, the, they're timely uh, and in more ways than, than you realize. And I'll have a, a sidebar with you about that, but that, that um, feedback is very, very timely at this time. Um, uh, just for the benefit of the committee uh, and speaking to issues brought up by Mr. Weldy, members of the committee should know that with regards to plastic bag usage, 
uh, Councilman Squilla has been intimately, actively engaged with that issue for months. And I just spoke with Councilman Squilla about that issue less than a month ago. And I've chosen not to get in it because he is leading the effort on that. Uh, with regards to um, uh, implementation of solar, the Energy Authority just had a briefing this afternoon about the work that they are doing around uh, solar. And um, they had a terrific updated report. Our last State of the Environment was March 2017. Uh, that was a four-hour hearing, and we thank Haji Malumian for helping to make that happen. And um, our office reached out to you, Mr. Weldy, in March for a meeting this past April. Uh, so hopefully we can get on your schedule in June to talk about what we may be doing in, um, in September. So that, that ask is still outstanding. Okay, uh, any more questions? Please, Councilman Green. Um, um, you made reference to Councilman Squall's initiative regarding plastic bags. Yes. Um, as um, members of this body and part of the council are familiar with the preemption attempts at the state level yes. regarding legislation, um, there's actually a bill in Harrisburg right now that, mm. you know, although Councilman Squall has not even introduced a bill, would preempt um, local municipalities around the Commonwealth to be able to have any type of plastic bag um, assessments. Uh, I know we've looked at this a couple different times, okay. um, but you know, to try to change the narrative on issues of plastic, um, there was a um, screening of a, of a documentary last Monday at the Free Library of Philadelphia called Plastic China. Uh, it's about a 90-minute documentary that I think is quite eye-opening um, for anyone that has a chance to watch it. Uh, and we are doing a briefing uh, on June 8th at 2 o'clock p.m. in the Council Caucus Room on a shortened version of that documentary um, to try to continue to change the narrative and thoughts regarding plastic, um, not only in the world, but also how we engage plastic mm. here in the city of Philadelphia. And I think it's one of those things that once you see it and get a perspective on how plastic is really um, taking over in a lot of ways. Yes. Um, China at one point was importing plastic from all over the world. And as a result of getting a better understanding how it's impacting their communities and the people in their country, they have decided to significantly reduce almost to zero wow. the amount of importation of plastic. Uh, it's, it's a product that is, uh, it's hard to even use the word beneficial. It's become a consumption-based item that we are very familiar with that we need to change our habits in reference to plastic. Okay. So, so again, that is uh, June 8th, Friday, what day June, of the week? Friday, Friday June 8th at 2 p.m. Right, in the caucus so room. And we will have some point to be refreshments there. to be provided. And we'll get information out because we're finalizing the details. Terrific, terrific. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the last, um, uh, please, 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 Councilman uh, Al Taltenberger. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Sure. I, I do have a question on Mr. Weldy's uh, uh, letter. I have to be very direct here. I'm new around here. But I'd have to say this. The work of the Environmental Committee doesn't always take place in committee form. People give us correspondence. We talk to one another. I mean, to just judge it on the amount of uh, committee hearings uh, we have is, uh, well, I, I think that's uh, un unwarranted. But I'll, that, that's my opinion as a member of this committee. I do have a question for you, and that's uh, in your last statement, little to no enforcement of the city idling laws, creating harmful emissions from idling vehicles, which account for the largest source of illegal air pollution in Philadelphia. And what is that based on? Well, what is what based on? What, what part of that? Well, the, the part that says it's the largest illegal air pollution in Philadelphia. So the transportation sector in 2017. Not the transportation sector. That's not my question. My question is idling. That's what you said in here. Right. But where'd you base that on? Yes, there are a lot of idling vehicles. Is it good for the environment? Absolutely not, because it's sort of wasted. But, right. but how do you say that's the largest? Because to be very direct, in Europe, and particularly in Germany, where I happen to have a number of my relatives mm -hmm. live, if you're caught in a traffic jam, you are required by federal law in Germany to turn your engine off. I don't know how well that would go in America, but that's the law. The fact is that you're basing this, what, what is it, the basis of it? Where did you get that information? Well, we did have a lot of, 
air pollution in Philadelphia decades ago, and that has receded due to uh, a lot of the Clean Air Act regulations in the 70s and, and then in the 90s. So Philadelphia and a lot of other cities have really cleaned up. There was a recent uh, American uh, Lung Association, I think, article that, that gave Philadelphia um, a failing grade for ozone, and ozone really, uh, most of ozone now is coming from car emissions. So, uh, and as I, as, as I was saying earlier, the transportation sector, and, and you can tell me what you object to in this statement, but uh, the transportation sector has now become the number one so source of carbon in the world. In the world. Okay. That was not my question. So you can extract question, from that view. that it is a large source of air okay. pollution. I, we I do not it. have any... I buy Sorry. it, actually, uh, in the sense that, that you're, you're, it's just normal. I mean, I'm outside quite a bit. In fact, mm -hmm. I've had most of my life outside. I have a degree in agriculture. I actually ran an operation for Friends Hospital for hmm. a number of years. Mm -hmm. So I have a sense of what the outside is like. And I have to say, in, in the environment is everything. That's why I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to be a member of this committee and to do the work with the, with the chair lady. The, the, the fact is, though, when you say something, i just like to have it backed up. I mean, how much idling is going on? There's some. Is it a lot? How, how much, you know, that's there, what, there, that there was are, my specific question. My right. specific question to you was, where did you get that fact? So, uh, this is, and this is New York City, I'll just preface that. I, I, when I was in New York City, I did a study with EDF, and we calculated that there were about five idling vehicles per block. So... We at, have, any, at any given time? At any given time. So it averaged out. Well, New so, York's a different city, York, but I don't I think know, you'll I, find that's, that that's, why I, that's why I stated that it okay, was different. I got city. it. So we have been, Clean Air Council, for the last three and a half years, we've been studying idling in Philadelphia. Okay. We have had a, a few volunteers. They go out just for a couple of minutes a day, and they have gotten about 2,000 idling reports just for a few minutes a day in this city. So... Uh, if you can walk down a street in Philadelphia and not feel that, not, not notice that there's an idling vehicle, then, then I'd be surprised. So the city agencies currently have about 6,000 vehicles. None of them have policies against idling. We have caught city, on video, city agency employees sleeping, going to lunch and leaving their vehicles unlocked and unattended with the with it, vehicle running. We have, we have caught them on video saying they don't care because they're not paying for the gas. Uh, I mean, it is astounding. We calculated, like I said earlier, about $6 million over the last two years of just idling for city vehicles in Philadelphia. Wait. For city vehicles? Yes. Sounds like you ought to turn that information over to the Inspector General. It was a burning fuel. We've but met, let me, we've let me met, ask we've you met this. with the controller's let me, office. Let me ask you this. I, I would like to go with you on your next idling roundabout. Okay. Okay. I would, I would really like to see, I think some of the figures that you even cited now are somewhat flawed. Okay. I would have to say they do exist and it shouldn't be. On the other hand, on the other hand, people do it when it's a very hot day to stay cool in their air conditioned cars. I mean, all people do it. It's a normal thing. And also the reverse. Um, you know, I, I've plowed a lot of snow and hours and hours on the, you know what? The best job I ever had was running a grounds department because yeah. I learned a lot about just people in general. And you know what, it gets cold out there. And uh, you know, people want to stay warm, so they run the engine. Is it right? Probably not. But the fact is, <laughs> human concerns are also a very important part of the, uh, you know, the environment. And so I, I want to work with you, and, and you can comment, please. I want to work with you on it, because I want to see what's real and, and some not real. Then you can teach me, and maybe I'll teach you a couple things. I'm sure you can. Uh, just to, to, for, you know, more education Please, for Christina. everybody. Thank you. Um, the, the city does have ordinances against idling, and all city employees are expected to follow all city laws. So okay. there, is a pol there are policies in place that city workers are supposed to follow. They don't. Obviously, we do have... Okay. We, when I was at the water department previously, we worked with Clean Air Council to receive those complaints when it was a water department vehicle, so the water department would know who it was, okay. who was That's you know important. doing it inappropriately. The, I think one of the things that is also a challenge is we don't expect volunteers to necessarily know all of the 
the minutia of the idling policy. They're, to your point, allowed to idle if it's under a certain temperature or over a certain yeah. temperature in order to keep you know, heating or cooling going. They're allowed to idle if it uh, helps to operate a piece of equipment. So a lot of, you can imagine diesel you know, vehicles that are crane operated or a digging or something else, they need the engine on. Police cars, for example, um, the engine has to be on for the computers to work. Oh. Uh, yep. So wow. they're never, not gonna shut off and reboot the computer every time. So they're, uh, to me. But those are opportunities as well for the city to consider how to separate the computer system from the engine yeah. system. So there's always opportunities to do more, but I just wanted to make that point of clarification, as well as um, because this is something we run into a lot in terms of perception about where Philadelphia's greenhouse gas emissions come right. from. Right. Most okay. people see a car and understand it's a pollutant. They don't look at a building and think that it's a source of pollution. And in Philadelphia, our buildings are 80% of our climate emissions. 68% okay. um, really? of buildings, 12% from industry. Industry operate out of buildings, so we combine that to 80%. Transportation is 17%, and waste is 3%. So just, I like to make sure people know that because I don't think most people look at our buildings as that um, source Offender. of emissions, and that's why the benchmarking law is so important. That's why we really focus a lot on building energy efficiency right now as a priority, but certainly work on transportation and waste as well. I, I appreciate okay. your clarification. Final comment, please. Um, yeah, I, I would just like to answer p part of your question. Um, buildings do account for the largest source of air pollution in the country, probably. The, uh, as, as a group, they're about 40% uh, in, in the country, I think. Um, but note, I did say illegal air pollution. So one thing that we can easily do in this city, uh, so j the other day, I'll just give you a quick anecdote. I, I was standing next to a vehicle that was idling. I asked the, the PPA agent if he could please give a ticket. He said, no, I need to wait five minutes. I said, no, that's not the law. The law is zero minutes in Philadelphia for a truck, right? So he walked off. I waited there. He came back, which was nice of him. He couldn't find it in his computer. I had to tell him where it was in his computer, what the code was, what the... They're not trained. PPA is not trained. No city agency is properly trained. The water department is probably the best department that we've dealt with, and we've dealt with almost all the departments in Philadelphia. While she was there, we met a number of times with, with her and some of her staff, and they did do a good job about getting the idling done. And now, when we have volunteers that go up to water department trucks that are idling, they, they run, they literally, the drivers literally run over their truck and turn them off, because they know that you're setting up to do a report. They know it. So I know that they've told their, their, the water department employees. Streets department, I'm not going to name all of them, okay? <laughs> but, but there are a number of, of high violators in the city. And, you know, I get, you know, th is it the highest source of air pollution in Philadelphia? Probably not. It is the highest source of illegal air pollution in Philadelphia that we can easily stop. Easily. And you know what? All you need to do is go up to someone, a, a police officer or a PPA, say, hey, you know it's illegal to idle in Philadelphia? No, I didn't. Okay, they'll turn their engine off and they know it next time. So there's an education component, but there's also a ticket component. Many, many people, they don't care until it hits their pocketbook. And they, they can, you know, you can say, hey, education, education. Until you actually hit someone in the pocketbook, they're not really going to care about it. And then the, the last thing that I want to say about this, well, for, first of all, I would love to sit down and explain the laws to you. Yep. And, and also take you on a, a tour of, oh. there's some really hot spots in Philadelphia that we're always getting. You can go there anytime and there's gonna be idling there. So, but the one last thing, yesterday I got a call from a woman who's I'll mother- I'll take you up on that. All right, good, I'll, I'll reach out to your office, thank you. Uh, thank yesterday you. I got a, a call from a woman who, who was nearly in tears. She lives in the Northeast. She said, hey, are you the people to talk about idling too? And I said, sure. She said, my mom has cancer and she's got asthma. She's been suffering for years from asthma. There are, there's a store outside of their, their house. She lives on the corner. There's a store on the corner there, too. All day, the trucks sit and idle. She said, nothing can be done about this. Well, why are the trucks there? They're dropping stuff off, so they're loading and unloading. There is a law in Pennsylvania that you have to put a sign up at every place. The, the law enumer enumerates how many parking spots you have. But if you've got a loading and unlo unloading, you have to put a sign up that right. says no idling. Nowhere in Philadelphia is this... So if you see one of these signs, take a picture and send it to me, because there are very few. Wawa has them, and that's about it. But because um, Wawa got sued from well, New Jersey. Well, there's Wawa's in Philadelphia. You just yeah. said Wawa got sued by New Jersey, so they put them up everywhere. So that's okay. why they did it. Um, but Eileen is a really—it's—it's it's a social and it's an environmental justice issue. 
Poorer neighborhoods have idling trucks in them much more than, than richer neighborhoods do because, uh, you know, okay. poor neighborhoods have the warehouses and the stores and things like that, and they're getting, they're suffering from this, and asthma is one of the highest rates, uh, we have the highest rate in the country among uh, child asthma. Okay. okay. Thank you. Well, Thank, thanks for your interest in that, I appreciate it. You're welcome. Yeah, your, your enthusiasm and passion for this issue certainly comes through and is, is very, very much appreciated. Um, to punctuate um, Councilman Al Taltenberger's point, you should know, members of this committee, that we had two evening meetings with Moms Clean Air Council, and there have been a couple of meetings with the Philadelphia Energy Authority. So yes, lots of work gets done um, in addition to the work uh, of this committee. Um, and so any other questions, comments, observations for our witnesses? With that said now, we will now go into a public meeting. The chair recognizes Council Member Green for a motion on bill number 180234. All right then, for sure. Uh, I should stay, no, I should let Councilman Green move the bill first. Mm, no, if some unreadiness, you want to make a statement before I make Yes, 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 I would like to. I want to invite both of our witnesses, if you have additional language for perspective of potential amendments, we're certainly open to that, as before we move this bill to the uh, second reading and final vote. We're cer certainly open and, and welcome any subsequent language, ideas that can improve the, uh, the merits of the bill. Yeah. I move that bill number 180234 be reported out of the committee with, with a favorable recommendation and that the rules of council be suspended so that this, so as to permit first reading of this bill the next session of council. Second. It has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 180234 be reported out of this committee with a favorable recommendation that the rules of council be suspended so as to permit first reading at the next council session. All those in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? So uh, let me correct the record that. I know I got to offer amendments. I forgot there were amendments. Councilman Green. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. Mm -hmm. I'd like to move that Bill Number One Eight Zero Two Three Four be amended. Uh, the amendments have been circulated to all members of council. Second it. It's been moved and properly second that Bill Number One Eight Zero Two Three Four as amended be reported out of this committee with a favorable recommendation that the rules of council be suspended so it's first reading at the next scheduled session of council. All those in favor uh, signify uh, by point saying. Of, point of information, point of information. Yeah. Um, we did the amendment, but now we ha I have to make a motion. Right, because I have to, you, as a chair, you can accept the motion, but I've got to move the amended bill out. So I, I made a motion to vote it out, but then I got to do now now that we've amended it, I got the motion as amended out, and then you can do the rest of it. So you can recognize me. Okay. Okay, Councilman Green. I move that bill number 180234 as amended be reported out of this committee with a favorable recommendation and that the rules of council be suspended as to permit first reading of this bill at the next session of council. Second. Okay, so it has been moved and properly seconded that bill number 180234 as amended be reported out of this committee with a favorable recommendation and that the rules of council be suspended so as to permit first reading at the next scheduled session of council. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All of the opposed? Seeing none, this bill has been approved out of committee with a favorable recommendation. This concludes this meeting. The mission continues.